Thank you so much. Um, I'm a massive fan of this festival. Uh, my name's Adele, as you've just heard, and it's my absolute pleasure to be uh, hosting this event with Denise Miner this evening. So, um, yeah, I'm, as I say, a massive fan of Denise's. And Garnet Hill, just for those of you who might not know this, uh, Denise's first novel was published in 1998. Um, and it became an instant sort of genre-shifting classic, winning the Crime Writers Association John Creasy Dagger Award for the best crime novel. And Denise has an unfeasible sort of 13 novels now under her belt. 17. Never. This is just absolutely incredible. And has created this wonderful band of sort of flawed, fantastic, mainly female um, protagonists including Alex Morrow, Paddy Meehan, and my favorite, Maureen O'Donnell. Um, and she's also generated short stories, plays, graphic novels, um, notably adapting Stieg Larsson's Millennium Trilogy. And she's also a brilliant, riveting, sparkling broadcaster. If you ever see Denise sort of um, doing reviews on the radio or telly, she's absolutely wonderful. Um, in 2014, Denise was inducted into the Crime Association's Hall of Fame and in the same year a judge for the prestigious Bayes Bailey's Prize for Women's Fiction. And in July, um, as far as I am aware, Denise, you're going to be chairing the Harrogate Crime Writing Festival? The programme chair for the Harrogate Crime Festival. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, she's also um, a style icon for many of us and the epitome of what I would say is the, the contemporary Scottish national treasure type of model. Um, so, Denise, a uh, massive welcome. So, but today we're here to discuss this fabulous uh, novel and Denise is going to be sort of um, signing uh, books at the end of this session. But um, this is... Uh, the first in a series of Darkland Tales. And I wanted to just sort of briefly read what the publisher Polygon, what the sort of concept for the series is, because I think it really does help to set this sort of overall context for what readers are going to experience with Rizio, which is a totally different read. Um, so the publishers say that in Darkland Tales, it's the best modern Scottish authors offering dramatic retellings of stories from the nation's history, myth, myth and legend. These are landmark moments from the past viewed through a modern lens and aligned to modern sensibilities. Each Darkland tale is sharply provocative, darkly comic, mining that seam of sedition and psychological drama that's always featured in the best of Scottish literature. So I wondered, Denise, whether we could start by hearing about this landmark moment, the landmark moment that you chose, and to set the scene for this, what is a, a properly fateful weekend that the readers get immersed in, in this, in your own contribution to the Darkland Tales. So what is this moment? Well, it's, it's a slightly lost moment because so much happened after it and so much happened before, but I think it's a very, very telling moment. And it's, uh, Mary Queen of Scots was having a dinner party and all the nobles of Scotland, pretty much, uh, broke into her dinner party. They grabbed her best friend, who was her advisor, who was a foreigner and, uh, and was good looking. So obviously we had to kill him because he might dilute, <laughs> might dilute the gene pool. And um, dragged him out and then they all stabbed him to death in her audience chamber, which was the throne room really. So. Uh, but they all had to stab him because if everybody stabbed him, nobody could be prosecuted for the crime or it would bring down that entire class. Yes. So it was Julius Caesar. These, these people were obviously, um, had read the classics. I mean, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar is about 20 years later. Yes. And I think it was performed for Elizabeth I, but it would have had huge resonances, this, this event. So they all stabbed him. So, that, so it's like they were like, 50 or 60 stab wounds in yes. the body um, mm -hmm. of this man. Um, but it was because they couldn't kill the queen, who's really who they wanted to kill. Yeah. She was pregnant, and it was a real kind of turning point in um, 
uh, Scottish, liter Scottish history. Yeah. So Mary, Queen of Scots, was pregnant. She's Catholic. The baby might be raised as Catholic, yes. but the lords of the congregation, the Calvinist um, revolution has really just, the Reformation has just started. Yes. So, what, so really what they're hoping is um, that she'll die, but they yes. won't have killed her. So they try to make it as scary as possible. So all the ingredients oh. for a fabulous, uh, a fabulous sort of revisiting by, by you, basically. I mean, you were born to do this. So, um, and Rizzio, um, the book is really deals with it in, in an unflinching and really evocative way with the grisliness of, of all of this and the inherent sort of terror that you, you're talking about there in this sort of immediate post-Reformation period, or the Reformation period as it's sort of uh, unra uh, unrolling. Well, you know, they're, they're so, things are so gory then. Absolutely. I'm just reading a book about the Medicis, and somebody um, staged a rebellion. So they killed all the rebels, there were about 200 rebels, and then what they did with the bodies was they nailed them onto a roof. I mean... <laughs> so, you know, people say, oh, there's a lot of shooting in those Quentin Tarantino books. I mean, yes. people lived through these things. <laughs> exactly. You know, really jaw-dropping. What, what, what I think you do brilliantly, though, is the, as I say, this inherent terror and grisliness is undercut and leavened all the time with your sort of characteristic wit and... Also, a sense of the absurd as well. Like, there's a really brilliant bit where you're talking about um, uh, Boswell lifting up somebody who's in a, a suit of armour by standing on their feet. And, you know, there's these sort of moments that punctuate this sort of like absolutely gory, horrific um, uh, saga, really. But um, I wondered, Denise, whether you might give us um, a little bit of a flavour of. Um, of the introductory yeah. chapter, um, and uh, well, you can describe where we're at. Right. So, um, so when I was approaching this, one of the problems was one of the problems I think for anyone writing history is how faithful do you make the dialogue, and yes. how faithful do you make the thoughts. Yeah. So I tried to write it in sort of Elizabethan language, but it just sounded rubbish, yeah. and it would have <laughs> it just sounds made up. And then if you water it down, I don't know if you watched Deadwood. Yes, yes, yes. Right, so Deadwood, you had to watch, that is proper contemporary language, but you had to watch it with the subtitles on. Yeah. And, and the, <laughs> the illusions that people are making in their language are impenetrable. So I thought, I'm just going to not do that. I'm yes. just going to tell it as a story. Um, so this is the very beginning. And I, and I have to say, all the people in this are real. And this is what really happened. David Rizzio plays tennis with his assassins. Late Saturday afternoon, 9th of March, 1566. Indoor tennis court, Palace of Holyrood, Edinburgh. Lord Ruthven wanted him killed during this tennis match, but Darnley said no. Lord Darnley wants it done tonight. He wants his wife to witness the murder because David Rizzio is her closest friend, her personal secretary, and she's very pregnant. So Darnley hopes that if she sees him being horribly brutalised, she might miscarry and die in the process. She's the queen. They've been battling over Darnley's demand for equal status since their wedding night. And if she dies and the baby dies, then Darnley's own claim to the throne will be undeniable. They're rivals for the crown. She knew that from the off. He wants it done in front of her. Darnley serves to Rizzio and Rizzio returns it with an elegant stroke. The cork ball soars across the court, reaches the far quarter and bounces high enough to land on the sloped wooden awning over the watcher's benches. There's a loud smack as it lands, rolls to the edge and falls onto the court. Point to Rizzio. Underneath that sloping roof is a man called Henry Yeer. He's watching the game, sitting on a bench built into the wall of the inner court. He's Lord Ruthven's retainer, and he's here to keep an eye on Darnley for the boss. Gear hates everyone here, and he especially hates tennis. <laughs> tennis is what's wrong with people. <laughs> Gear is very pale, his eyes rimmed red because he hasn't been sleeping. He's watchful, he sees plots everywhere. He thinks in binaries, good, bad, man, woman, Calvinist, Catholic, for God or against God. Once fervently Catholic, he's now ferociously Calvinist. And when he saw the truth, he embraced it, and he hates those who don't. Those Catholic holdouts, 
How can they hold on to these old broken ideas? How can they defend a church so corrupt, so murderous, such a betrayal of the one true faith? They disgust him. He doesn't know how they can live with themselves. Other Calvinists congratulate him on his passion. They overlook the implied violence of his fanaticism because he's on their side. The Reformation is recent, the issue undecided, it's not yet safe. Everyone is afraid of a revival of the Roman religion, of being killed for their beliefs, of spies and foreign interventions. Men as hot and spirited as ye are useful to the movement. So tomorrow morning when fellow Calvinists hear that Year was creeping around Edinburgh, when they learn what he did and who he killed, they'll all feign surprise. But in the darkness of their hearts, they'll each remember his sallow face and his wide watery eyes, his explosive reaction to any hint of dissent. And they'll admit to themselves that this was inevitable. And they, they rewarded his disquieting, disquieting fervor and they've always known this could happen. Could have been any one of them stabbed in their beds. Year was always a killing spree looking for an excuse. Thank you so much. I, I really love that uh, right at the outset, we've got this sort of uh, unbelievable layers going on as well. I, I love the idea of, of the, the idea of the court, you know, so the tennis court and, and obviously the sort of royal court and also that sort of idea of, you know, judging these proceedings and, and so on. And um, also in that first fantastic um, scene, setting of the scene, you know, you've got this sort of rivalry, but also that homoerotic undertone as well between Darnley and, and Rizzio. No, they were sleeping together. <laughs> exactly. They, were, he, they, they actually had slept together and Darnley exactly. was known to sleep with men. Exactly. But there wasn't there wasn't a category of gay then. It wasn't a, it, sexuality was much more fluid then. It was much. Yes. Do you know what I mean? It's like a, you know, gay as a kind of monolithic identity is very much an oppositional identity. Exactly. So until you start trying to kill people for being gay, they killed people for um, sodomy, but they didn't yes. kill people for sleeping with men. Yes. Um, but so you don't really have that kind of identity. Yeah. Sex is a lot more about power and. Exactly. In, in, in that time. It's just so brilliant because you don't know whether it is an absolute loathing or a real sort of like, as I say, a homoerotic infatuation going on as well. It's so brilliantly written through. But also you're touching there on this sort of introducing this glowering psychopathic presence of, of yeah. And I absolutely love that character. I mean, I think that um, although the book is called Rizzio, you've used... Yeah, in a really brilliant way through the novel. And I wondered why you decided, because there's such a sort of like, almost like pantheon and hundreds of different characters that you could have used. And I wondered why you decided to develop this character alongside the main protagonist. Well, Year was one of the two people who were killed for this uprising that was conducted by everybody in Scotland. Yeah. And looking at the... Um, uh, the capital, the storming of the capital in the States, yeah. right? You can see exactly what it was like, right? There was just too many of them. So Trump will not get done for that. Yeah. Who'll get done for that is someone who went there with their pal yeah. because they like The Apprentice. That's who'll get done for that. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So that's who <laughs> Year is. Yeah. And when you think about the um, all the people in the the palace for that whole time yeah they were the the, the people that in the, the central hall running away with a podium and just yeah. sitting in chairs and all that kind of yeah. thing do you know what i mean um so uh it, it's just such a familiar kind of setting but yeah. i actually find you're really sympathetic i think he's one yeah. of the few people with um real integrity yeah although although he's He's a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's bad. Um, but uh, um, but uh, so he he is a really violent man. But he is really struggling with the question of the day, which Precisely. is: should we follow this religion or that religion? And how can we really decide? I mean, we are asked often to decide about things like how how to worship God, and this is the only right way, or you know. Like the trans debate, I'm not going to get into that, but yes. how can we possibly know? Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What's the, I mean, it's, it's much more honest to say, 
I don't really know, but I don't want people being picked on. But, but I don't, you know, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's almost like there's no space for undecidability at this time, you know, like yeah. you, you, you mentioned there about the binaries, you know, so we, we see that in this sort of insurgent witch hunting that is happening at that time as well. And as you say, like that, you know, you, you can't sit in the middle. Well, I'm a, a wee bit of Catholic and a wee, wee bit Calvinist, yeah. you know, it's almost like you will die, you know, the faithfulness. Well, the, thing is, the thing is, most people are a wee bit Catholic and a wee bit, a wee bit Calvinist. <laughs> yes. And they do think the church is corrupt. Yes. But the people who are um, at a higher level, yeah. they are dealing in binaries. But most people alive at the time yeah. are still going to confession. Yeah. But they are aware that the church is very corrupt and they don't agree with yeah. that. So it's really, you know, the, so the, the visibility of decision making is a bit of a lie. Yeah. But that kind of moral ambivalence where people say, well, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. And I know that a lot of, there's been some fantastic reviews of the book, uh, rightly, and many reviews have, t have spoken about the sort of dialogue, uh, as you mentioned earlier on, being, you know, hard boiled and owing much to the sort of like genres that you've sort of specialised in so far, or, or you've bent and adapted and developed. But it strikes me that these are the most apt forms that you could have for this sort of pathological dynamic of the period, you know, that, um, you know, we're talking about like, well, it's a merger and it's almost like, well, you're having to do these things at that time and it is this sort of, you use the term readily and I really, really love that. And I just wondered, you mentioned a little bit about uh, this decision making that you'd made around melding the language and in, in, including some um, historic, but also so this sort of contemporary speech. And I wondered if you'd talk a little bit more almost about the decision making about the design of the the book, because it looks um, like a slim text, but it's packed with stuff, you know, and it's a real sort of uh, rapid read as well. And mm. I just wondered about how you'd conceived it and what, why it, it, it it's it's as uh, fast moving as it is. What's the decision making well, around think, that? Well, I think I think rather than fictionalised, because the next one's Jenny Fagan's Hex, yes, which I haven't yes. read yet, but I'm desperate no, to read. Me too. But I think it's it's instead of saying it's fictionalised versions of it, they're narrativised, which yeah, it, you know, it fits it into a kind of narrative arc. And actually, because of the shape of that weekend, it fits beautifully. Yeah. But one of the reasons that a slim volume feels really hard-boiled is because slim, the hard-boiled fiction started at a time when paper was rationed. Oh, right. Yeah. So you had to write really short books because you couldn't get... Like, all Graham Greene's early books are very right. short. So I think there's something great about really short books. Yeah. And I think books that get fatter and fatter... You know, there was a big um, thing with publishers a few years ago and they kept saying, we need a big, fat, hefty book because then people yeah. feel... But it, it, the story should determine the size. And I think yes. there's something... Um, you can add real pace if you... If you have to shave lots out, there was loads of bits that got cut out. Like it was a right. whole big chunk that was the history of the, diff the changing social meanings of public executions. Right. Because during the Reformation, before the Reformation, a big, big thing in the Catholic Church was you don't know when you're going to die, so you can't have the right sacraments or say your confession mm -hmm. just before you die, because you might be just about to die, say confession, and then lie to somebody and then you die. Well, you haven't confessed that, so <laughs> you're going to hell, do you know what I mean? So it's very legalistic, yeah. right? Um, so, uh, so there was a big thing about if you're being publicly executed, you get to say your confession, you get yeah. extreme unction, and then you die. So it was a collective um, witnessing of a perfect death. But then comes the Reformation, and Reformation um, martyrs are being killed for their faith. Right. So the audience no longer feel that the the um, execution is a collective uh, um, witnessing of someone, you know, um, making penance. Now it it has a very it's about the state and the state exerting power, yes. and um, so anyway, I th I thought it was I thought it was really interesting. It's also very gory because I think if you're if you're reading something and it's quite dull, it's good if you put a murder in it. Yes. Then I'll I'll read on. I mean, the way that you have almost like distilled that 
historical knowledge into these uh, moments where, I don't, I don't know whether it's because it's written as though, you know, we're in the present tense as readers, um, you are, you feel like you are an, an eye, eye, eyewitness to hideously frightening uh, episodes. You know, the action that's taking place in these really claustrophobic turret rooms of the court, or as you, as you mentioned, that knowledge about um, executions and so on and so forth. We are there in the crowd at the, gall you know, at the gallows. Um, and that idea of this febrile atmosphere um, with, as you mentioned, like re religious fanaticism, radicalization, mm -hmm. political venality, acts of terrorism, abuses of power, this national psychopathy, sound familiar? Um, you know, um, you, uh, you know, you evoke that, you know, we are there, we're not sort of um, looking at all the sort of painful research detail, we're actually in the crowds and in those rooms and so on. I wonder whether you might give us a flavour of, more, more of a flavour of that as well, when we pick up on, yeah, my favourite character, um, as he resurfaces in a later episode, um, and this is a really beautiful episode where you combine in this idea of the spaces that I wanna, I wanna hear more about how you research these spaces and places, this terror, uh, the paranoia, and almost like the, the way that you're making the violence like mundane, you know, or you're given an impression that this is actually sort of um, expedient you know, for, for characters. So I was thinking around that sort of uh, page 61 or 62 where you're talking about, yeah, as is resurfacing. Um, so this is Adam Black was a... Uh, I'll maybe just read that bit then. Adam Black is notorious. He's everything Henry Year isn't. He's, for, he's a 40-year-old Dominican friar, well-off, cheerful, lascivious, and he's much travelled... He's been all over Europe, once all the way to the Holy Land. He's sympathetic to the transgressions of those who come before him for confession because Black is a sinner himself. He's suspected of being a spy. It's rumored that he reports to the Spanish, he reports to the French, he sends missives to the Vatican in cipher. His spy name is John Noir. That's what they call him in their letters by return. Ask John Noir if... Tell John Noir to seek. Must John Noir find? Everyone in Edinburgh knows these facts, and Black is only tolerated because he's not often in the city, and when he is, he's never there for long. He was chaplain to Mary of Guise, the current Queen's mother, and his official status is now murky. Adam Black's front door is small and pale blue with a large brass knocker brightly buffed. His house stands alone on a patch of land that backs onto Greyfriars Cemetery. Year thinks he has been brought here because he desperately needs to talk about matters of faith. He wants to know if his chest should hurt like this, if he's been mistaken in his conversion. He wants to ask why God is making men choose between religions like this when they can't, they can't know. They're gambling their immortal souls. Gear can see both sides of the argument now. He's guessing, but this feels like an answer of sorts, finding himself here at the priest's house. God shouldn't ask men these questions. Year looks at Adam Black's door. He wants to go in, but the house is in darkness. Still, it's a sign finding himself guided here. So he tries the door. He's never done that before. And in these porous moments, every tiny thing can take on significance and be read as a sign from God. The door yields. The bolt was not properly pulled. Henry Year steps back from the street into Father Adam Black's parlour. He wants to do the right thing, make the right choices. It's a gamble. But he saw Rizzio's face cut through with a blade and his eyes looked like lips. And then he's standing by a bed in a small room, a stifling room that smells of wax and old men's clothes. And Year finds himself smiling. He doesn't have to decide, it's been done for him. He's holding a knife he's never seen before. He's holding it in his right hand, which is covered in blood. It's warm blood and it's dripping onto the floor in a way he finds amazing. The blood of the lamb. He's washed. 
Amazing. Not going to tell you. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, I wondered whether I, I mean, we could talk all night. I've got a million questions, but I did really want to ask you a little bit more about your conjuring of what I would describe now as like the precarity of women in this moment in, in history. Uh, it feels like there are terrifying risks, you know, there's, uh, whether it's women in power or, or women not in, in, in power. And, for me, it feels like that's front and centre in the book, but um, I wanted to ask you, how did you feel about Mary as a subject? And, and with your knowledge of feminism, of, your, of our understanding about contemporary issues, of course, of control and so on and so forth, tell, tell me more about how you felt about her. Well, you know, I wasn't, I, I'm not very interested in royals. <laughs> so I'm just not interested and, and there's so much written about her and it's quite yeah. unctuous do you yeah, know what I mean yeah. and, and I, I just think there must have been more interest in women in Edinburgh at that time it's yeah. just not, she's not somebody that really grabs me yeah. but as a pregnant woman one of the questions that I've been asked a lot about is imagine doing that to a pregnant woman if a woman's pregnant she is more likely to be assaulted by her partner than, any, than at any other time in her life and that is still surprising to some people to hear that mm -hmm. so being pregnant and um, being in a, a, a really complicated relationship um, is not an un, unfamiliar experience for a lot of people. Yeah. And um, so she's married to this guy who's drunk all the time. I have to say, his dad was such a bad man. And yeah. his dad, I envisaged his dad as Donald Trump. Yeah. And him as Trump Jr. Yeah. Darnley's Trump Jr. Absolutely. So, do you know what I mean? So, so he's yeah. drunk all the time yeah. in a way that people say he's drunk all the time. Everyone's drunk all the time, but he's <laughs> so drunk all the time. People are talking about it. But there is a real, with Darnley, there's a real, you know, with Don, with Don Jr., there's something missing. There's a real yeah. spark missing, like he's been crushed at birth. Yeah. And, um, and, and you know it's the shadow of this man. Lennox. It's the yeah. shadow of Lennox, yeah. yeah. And Lennox is the mover and shaker in the background. Yeah. Um, so she's, because she's a woman, I mean, really, they cannot deal with the fact that there's a queen. So the, the, the um, first trumpet call against the monstrous regiment of women is not long out. Yeah. John Knox comes to visit her regularly and makes her cry. Yeah. And she's a hard-faced so-and-so, Mary. Yeah. She, she's not, you know, she's, she, she grew up in the, the French court. She's yeah. not oblivious to stuff like this. So they despise her for her, her femininity. Yeah. And actually, I mean, I don't think that her situation is that unfamiliar. Yeah. If you think about the first minister and the abuse the first minister takes, yeah. wouldn't it be brilliant to live in a country where people could actually serve publicly and then just stop and go out and work in a shop? Wouldn't that yeah. be brilliant? I think so. You know what I mean? It's not safe to be a woman in power. Yeah. It's really not safe. It's not even really safe to be a successful woman. Yeah. And so she doesn't feel that un she doesn't feel as unfamiliar as you would expect her to feel. Yeah. So um but at the same time she is royal. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So she is, you know, she is there is that real eugenic sense of we're better than everybody else. Yeah. And the great men of Scotland, you know they think they're better than everybody else. So they're very difficult to identify with. Yeah. So there's there's a, there's a line in it where one of the lords they all kneeled uh, in front of Mary at one point, and one of them got blood on his tights. Yeah. Tights were very expensive. Yeah. In fact, people were spending so much money, on, men were spending so much money on tights. Elizabeth I introduced a law saying only the oldest son in a family could wear coloured tights. Is that not the title of a chapter, The it Price is, of the Tights? Because I did yeah, think one of the Price the, of the Tights a lot. Yeah. The, the chapter had in is just unbelievable. But, um, anyway. but I mean, I don't know if you, you remember the period before Lycra. I think you probably do. <laughs> but tights were so it. <laughs> so they're all wearing really itchy, massively expensive tights. But he gets blood on his tights, and it's a quote from the time. And he, he stood up and he said, the, the loss of one mean man is less important than any damage that could be done to this class of lords. Right. So they're, they're very hard to care about, these yeah. people, because they do think that people like us are filth. Yeah, exactly. And it is eugenic, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your work, uh, your oeuvre is unapologetically feminist. It's one of the reasons why we love you. I have to tell you. you, the reason I wrote Garner Hill was because the <laughs> Women's Library ran a crime writing course and I was, I was writing a crime novel and I was stuck. 
And this is like 1995 or something like that. And, and I came on that course run by Mary Wings and yeah. she told me how to write a crime novel. Well, the reason why you wrote it was because you're a brilliant writer and that novel well, was... Well, that obviously, you that's, know, that's what I put uh, my autobiography, yeah. but at the Paisley Festival, I'm saying it was because of the Women's Library. Um, I, I mean, I, I thank you ever so much, Denise, for being so kind. But, um, but yeah, I was just sort of picking up on that point of, like, um, almost like the... What are you trying to do in this novel, apart from almost, like, indicting the the unctuousness, the horrible, cowardly, darnly behaviour and the puppet masters who, who want a, a man um, on the throne. I felt as well that you were also deconstructing in this really readable way the sort of uh, model of the historical no novel that can tend to romanticise and allied persecution and routine violence <laughs> against women in marriage, you know, the denial of rights and justice and so on is sort of like, it's a slippery area in a lot of its historical fiction. And for me, it was like a really satisfying read from that point of view as well, where there was no sort of like hiding place. It was like- you, Well, the murders you, always happen in the next room, in yeah. historical, not in narrativized histories. Yeah. And I often think that when uh, historians write books about things, they're not really talking to us, the audience. They're talking to other historians. Yeah. And they're showing other historians have done their work. So they don't want to get caught out by anybody. But I just, I just thought, well, I don't, think I don't think historians have that much respect for me anyway, so I'm just going <laughs> <laughs> to... You can either do it with confidence that yeah. you're right, or you can just chance your arm, which is my entire career. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you do it brilliantly with that, with feeling it. These are human beings. These are real acts that, uh, that happened, that were normalised, that were part of this culture. And I wondered whether, because it is a successful departure for you, whether this has given you a real appetite to grapple with more historical subjects in this way, you know? Well, actually, you know, a lot of people said, is this part of a bigger book? And, uh, and I couldn't say, because they hadn't actually announced that it wasn't, it was a series yet. People didn't see, but I couldn't write more on this subject because no. otherwise I would just be making the whole series about me. So I started thinking, what could I do that isn't dark lands? Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, so I'm, I am researching something right great. now. Great, yeah. great, yeah. because it's, it's a very, very exciting thing. I think it's, it makes me remember what it was like to read Garnet Hill and just thinking, wow you know this is the crime writing that you really love but actually it's you know rinsed through with feminism as well how the hell is that you know why has it not been done before so it's a thrilling read from from that perspective but I did w wonder because I know you to be somebody who has done like proper proper academic research not just proper proper historical research but academic research that is around um around feminism and, and, and around the law and the way that women are treated and mistreated. And I just wondered about how you felt that that knowledge had been brought to bear in this particular case. Are there things that you felt like it was satisfying to do with thinking about what the contemporary issues for, for women today? And I think Louise uh, Welsh has just sort of, in praising you recently, has said, you're a really brilliant ad advocate you know, you're, you've got a fantastic advocacy for women through, uh, through your work. And I just wondered whether there was a, a message for us here at all. Well, I don't know if there's a message so much, but it's perspective, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? So I think, yeah. like me and Louise and people of our generation, writers of our generation, we didn't really feel entitled to say but we just thought, well, we'll have a fucking go anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and there Thank are goodness. so many perspectives like that, not just feminist perspectives, but people from all sorts of backgrounds, you know, like Darren McGarvey. We need all those voices where we hear the same Absolutely. stories all the time. And I, and I often think, you know, with crime fiction and this kind of fictionalized narrative, these are oral traditions in storytelling, right? And I do think all art starts as craft and then it becomes professionalised, and then you have to do a degree to do pottery. And then, you, do you know what I mean? People were making pots before there were universities, do you know what I mean? So I think, I think a lot of really vervous, exciting, pacey storytelling comes from or the oral tradition of storytelling. Yeah. So if you can tell a story to somebody at a bus stop, and we're from 
Glasgow and it's en um, and So who can't tell a story, do you know what I mean? So you know not to go into, was it a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Well, we yeah. simply don't know. <laughs> you just say, all right, make it a Tuesday. Do you know what I mean? And I think, um, yeah. I think if you approach it from that point of view, I think there are loads of fresh voices coming through in publishing. Oh, yes. And publishing are really, really striving. I mean, one of the things is publishing is very monocultural. But yeah. one of the reasons it's monocultural is because they don't pay very much. So you have to have money, and they're all in London. Yeah. So you have to have money to be able to work in that area. So all those people who do that job, they're brilliant people, and they're yeah. working for peanuts. And uh, so they're all looking for new stories. So if there's, there will be someone in the room who thinks, I could wear a big coat and write a story. Do it, <laughs> because they're actually listening now. So that's, that's the generation Louise and I are coming from. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's absolutely. like, you know, you can either feel entitled or you can just give it a go. Uh, too right, absolutely. I know that I want to take a couple of uh, questions from the audience, Denise, but I did want to ask this thing because I think another thing that is like palpable, uh, palpably felt uh, for any readers of this book is these incredibly vivid impressions of, I suppose, the sensory aspects of the spaces um, where the drama takes place. Um, there's one bit where it felt like the space was almost like a, a womb. You know, um, you describe this room that Mary's in as smelling of love and conviviality. And then when the men enter, the warmth evaporates, replaced by alarm, you know, and obviously it is alarming when people are killing your best pal and everything, but, um, but I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, um, you, you're minimising a little bit the research that you've done, but why you, why you um, decided to add this wonderful passage towards the end about uh, the passage, in fact, of time, of memory, of almost like the relics, the, yeah. you know, the detritus of history. I just found it, it was another real amazing gear change. So I just wondered about the research process, about the spaces, how did he get that? Well, I wondered why this story was poorly remembered, because it is remembered that, that Rizzio died, but the, the detail... Lord Ruthven wrote a full account. It's available on the internet, if you can be bothered reading it, if you're a bit nerdy. Um, we're at a book festival. Probably, <laughs> probably a few of us are quite nerdy. But... Um, uh, you know, all the details are known. Everybody knows that Henry Year went into town and killed at least one priest. He might have killed, there was another priest killed in Edinburgh that night. Um, so why is it, it's kind of, people are kind of like, oh yeah, Rizzio, you know, why is it not remembered? And it's not remembered because it is so shaming. It is shameful. Yeah. It was a shameful, <sighs> shameful episode. They attacked a pregnant woman and killed her best pal in the hope that she would, you know, have a miscarriage and she was helped by an old lady yeah. do you know what I mean there was an old woman there who nobody paid any attention to and she managed to affect her escape yeah and I think one of the reasons is those kinds of things where people do kind things or people are yeah. loving they're not tend, they don't tend to be remembered historically yeah people are brutal or greedy or magnificent or they spend lots of money they get remembered yes. but those small gestures that are world-changing do not get remembered and, uh, and that thing about the space, I think the reason, so Mary never went back to Holyrood and those rooms were made into junk rooms. Yeah. But then when Walter Scott wrote about Mary, Queen of Scots, English tourists, and it was English tourists, yeah. came up and they said, they, kept, they, they said, can we get a tour of her rooms? And it was full of rubbish and they took it away and they said, this was, the, this was Mary, Queen of Scots Walkman. And, and uh, so now, if you go to Holyrood, there are these little cabinets and it says, you know, this um, long believed to have belonged to Mary Queen of Scots. Yeah. So I got a private tour and I said to the curator, why does it say uh, rumoured to belong to Mary Queen of Scots? And she said, because it didn't. But everyone's all, because it was made a hundred years after she died. <laughs> but everyone's, everyone's always believed this was her necklace. Yeah. So, so we don't want to put it in there and say this was long, you know, people made a mistake. But it was because th that whole history, they just shut the door on it. Yeah. And time passed. And then when she was far enough in the past not to be any kind of threat and the Reformation was settled, yeah. then she became this romantic figure. But I do think romanticism is a way of not really looking at the Absolutely. knife through the cheek. Do you know, it is a way of not looking at, you know, there was the, there's a woman in the story and her husband was died, but he had he'd been treasonous. And they stuffed him uh, after he died, and they took him to the Scottish Parliament, and they put him on trial. Oh, 
And yeah, so Crazy that I mean, people. why do we not know that? <laughs> so I, I was talking about this at the Edinburgh Book Festival, and this woman stood up and she said, "Ah, there's another guy who was embalmed and put on trial. He was he was disinterred from his grave, stuffed, and put on trial for crimes he'd committed." It's our history, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, can are there people? I'm going to have to do this because I can't. I don't have bifocals on. But are there any? Questions for Denise from our audience. I know that there's somebody with a T-shirt on and a, a mic, I think, around. Is there anybody who... Oh, I don't worry if there aren't, because we'll just keep rambling. No, exactly. Anybody who wants to ask a question? You're quite cosy. That... <laughs> That's the first time I've ever spoken to people in Paisley and they've not immediately assaulted me with... <laughs> 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 I, I had a further question. We have talked about a few genres, uh, Denise, but the, the, the yeah storyline, I think, gets closest to horror um, for me. And I did wonder, when you say the word horror, um, I'm thinking another term that I would use to describe the book is, is filmic. And um, I just wondered about whether we ever might see... Uh, Rizzio in any other format? Is there a possibility of, of that? Well, I've actually just written a script for a so. film company in the States. Oh, my but, goodness. Um, but, but, you know, I have to say, quite often new writers sell the rights to their book and they announce that they've sold the rights to their book. Yes. They're, the likelihood of it getting made is tiny. So I don't want everyone to get really excited, but... But I actually found things in the story that I hadn't found before. Like one of the things that I, I really noticed when I was writing that was um, that Darnley didn't want to leave his dad in the palace when they escaped. Right. And he, he sort of, he nearly didn't leave with them because he didn't want to leave his dad on his own. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, you know, he wanted to be better than his dad. That's a beautiful passage when there's that penny dropping moment for Darnley that you're describing of just that, the realisation he no is better. as shitty as his dad. And yeah. that, I mean, it's just so brilliantly woven through the whole thing as well. I, I love that Trump analogy. I mean, I yeah. think that is so, so incredibly apt. Yeah. But. And there's another analogy, which is that Edinburgh was full because they were having the parliament, right? So it was basically Edinburgh in August. Right, you know how busy it is, <laughs> and then then they announced anyone who doesn't, anyone who's here for the parliament and doesn't get out in the next three hours is going to be hung. Yes. So imagine the whole festival leaving Edinburgh <laughs> in a three-hour period. Can you even imagine? So when I was writing the, the film script, I was thinking, I bet the local chat was exactly the same as it is every year, which is, oh my God, they're here again. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I just wondered as well about, like, you, you spoke um, earlier on about, um, I suppose, the historical baggage, you know, and this sort of myth-making idea, and just about how um, you resisted. I mean, you're talking about, like, um, you know, setting aside uh, expectations of you by... Um, historians who have maybe got a different expectation about what you're going to deliver, but how do you actually um, shed that? How do you manage that sort of knowing and just releasing yourself into the writing process? Well, I think I'm really always writing for myself, to be honest. And, and you know, you can feel, I think, if anyone who writes, you always hear a committee on your shoulder saying yes. negative things. It's very difficult. And, and what you just have to do is say, well, I'm just going to do it anyway. And, um, uh, and so it is an act of defiance, yeah. writing. Yeah. Because you never sit down and think, here I am being brilliant again. <laughs> uh, you know, nobody thinks that. Do you know what I mean? You sit down and you think, oh, that's such shit. Oh, it's true. You can't even spell. I can't spell. Right, so, so when I was young, spelling was a big, big thing. It was right. like you know, everywhere you went, people would say your spelling's terrible, <laughs> and uh, even now the publishers say that. But we've got spell check. Yes. So had it not been for spell check, I might have been too ashamed to be a writer. But I think yes. if you start from a, a, a place of, um, is this interesting? So, so what I do is I write and then I reread what I've written. Mm -hmm. And if I'm rereading what I've written, and I, and the point where I think. 
I'm just going to go and get a cup of tea. I think, right, you need to put something in there because it's quite boring. And if I find yeah. myself reluctant to come back to the, the reading it, yes. um, because you never, you never um, uh, put it down and go and get a cup of tea when someone's just about to get stabbed. You yes. always do it once they've been <laughs> stabbed. Do you know what I mean? So, so, you know, just trying to be a reader and a writer yes. at the same time. Um, so, but it's really, I'm really always writing for me. It's, it's a very kind of um, private business writing, I think. Because I was really surprised to read, um, I think it's in the fly life, you sort of talking about uh, the first draft um, getting a, a negative response, and I thought, this is somebody who's written 17 novels and like millions and millions of stuff, and uh, but I just thought it was really great that you were just sort of like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got that sort of uh, that feedback at that time. So it's quite reassuring to hear, I suppose, that there might be budding authors or people who might want to embark on this sort of like mad career, um, just to sort of know that, that, that you you've got do... To, you've got to hear it. You've still got, listen to that. You can read a lot of books by very established writers who do not take negative feedback. Yeah. But you need fresh eyes on something because yes. they need to tell you what's not working, and they need to, and you need to hear it. So you get the notes back, and you gird your ego, and then you read it, and you think they don't understand me or my music. They don't even know what I'm trying to do. And go in a big huff, and then get over yourself and remember yes. they're only trying to make it better. Yeah. Right. So you really have to trust the people you're working with, and. Um, and you have to hear criticism or you won't get any better or you won't make that particular thing better. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, you know, doing things like this, you are listening to me. What the fuck are you doing? Do you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So your <laughs> ego will get fed in lots of ways. You don't need yeah. people to say that's absolutely brilliant. So but James Crawford, who's the guy who came up with this, he does yeah. Scotland from the air. Yeah. Right? He's a cheeky bitch, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, I wrote a short story for him, um, and it was, uh, it was called Nemo Me Impune Intensit, which is the motto over the, the gates of the Edinburgh Castle, and it yeah. means anyone who crosses me will pay. I don't know if you know that's like the national motto of Scotland. That, that sounds like Putin. Yes, it, it does. Yeah, <laughs> it's really venomous, kind of. Yeah. Um, but, so I wrote a short story for him, and I didn't know him, and he wrote back and he said, uh, yeah, that's fine. He said, see that bit in the middle? Just cut that bit out. That doesn't need that. There's wow. no point in having that there. And, um, and, and I thought, I don't think you know who I am. <laughs> uh, but I was in a hurry, so I cut it out, and then the story won loads of prizes. Yeah, but it won them because I cut that bit out because he said cut that bit out. Mm. So the original draft of that, he sent it back and he said, "This isn't what I asked you to write," and right. it wasn't what he'd asked me to write. Right. I was quite annoyed. Yeah. So that was written in a really rushed way, right. which is why it has the pace it has. Because it's a, for me, I don't know whether the concept um, was sort of reshaped as a result of what you delivered as this first in the series. But, you know, the description of the concert, it's absolutely and utterly what, you no, know... I, I, they wrote the description after I right, the Right, right, I was going to say. <laughs> but uh, I wondered, Denise, about all the genres, um, you know, because you are, like, polymathic or, you know... You, a put chancer. yourself in so a many chancer. different but when you approach doing a new thing as you have done here is it sort of um, back to square one in terms of thinking uh, you know I'm uh, are you drawing on all those experiences and all that success and so on and so forth you know when you're approaching say graphic novel writing for the first time or uh, adapting other people's work or you know uh, I still got this unbelievable vivid memory of, of watching your film um you know and these are all very distinct disciplines you know and the, and the screenwriter and so on um are you you know back in that sort of place that as i say budding writers might be in each time yeah or totally. are you growing but another in? thing another thing to remember is if you're a woman artist you will not be remembered you just won't, right? And, I, and I'm not saying that out of bitterness. I'm saying that because I can look back at 2,000 years of literary history, yeah. music history, art, visual arts, yeah. dance, theater. They're not gonna remember what you did. So you might as well have a party. 
because they're not going to. So, so you know, when you realise that, and you realise, you know, other people are copying you, but they went to Oxford and they're male and they're getting the credit for it. Yeah. Okay. You know, other people are ripping your work off. They're doing exactly what you did, and they're getting the credit for it. But you're a doughy old woman who dresses strangely, <laughs> and no one wants to say, "Oh, do you know what I mean?" Okay, well, that is the case. So what I thought about was I thought about, about jazz musicians, right? Yeah. And I thought, you know, they invented jazz because nobody was really looking yeah. at them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So these are the facts. What is freeing about this space and this, the freedom in the space of being a woman artist is you can do whatever you yeah. fucking want. Because no one's going to say, oh, but it doesn't fit in with the brand that you established with your, uh, you know, um, prize winning. No, you can just do yeah. whatever you want. Do you know what I mean? And, and actually, you know, to be a, a writer full time is such a privilege. And it's not a privilege because you get money, because you don't really get that much money. It's a yeah. privilege because you get to connect with people you've never met. Yeah. And you get to tell stories to people who need a story yeah. to get them through the year. And you get to speak to people. And, you know, one of my books has just been um, uh, translated into Hebrew. And I was right. in quite a conundrum about the cultural boycott of Israel. Yes. Yeah. But, but I really wanted that book to come out in Hebrew because this, one of the central characters is called Finn Cohen. And I really right. wanted somebody to pick that up and think, oh, I'll just read a sh shit novel. And then realize there's a big Jewish community in Glasgow and yeah. they're really assimilated and they're very Scottish. Yeah. And, they're, you know, and they, they live lives that are not about Israeli politics and they're yeah. not interested in that rabbi from Brooklyn. Yeah. What an incredible privilege. Yes. Because I've been so touched by reading Zola or, yes. you know, people that I, if I met them, I wouldn't have anything in common with them, but that, there's that common humanity. Yes. And so I think I'm very, very aware of um, what a privilege it is to be a writer. Yeah. So, so, you know, but superficially, you look at writers and you think, well, they have very high status and people listen to them. But that's not really the joy of it. The real yeah. joy of it is that kind of hand holding in the dark with other human beings who might not even be alive yet. Because yeah. I've read, you know, like Don Quixote is one of the funniest books I've yeah. ever read. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, there's still images from that that really stick in my head. Yeah. And, and um, uh, you know, that's really what writing is about. It's really about... It's not about staying on brand and it's not being the crime writer yeah. or anything like that. It really is about connecting with other human beings, you know? I think that... Uh, Sorry, that, that was very grand. Yeah. I sounded very no, grand there, but... But it's why you are, are t a total icon for us in Women's Library and uh, also somebody who provides inspiration for us all. You know, that it, it just if you're not there in history, if you're not, um, you don't consider yourself a writer or can see yourself reflected in the literary canon or whatever, mm -hmm. just do it anyway. Just do it, yeah. Um, well, thank you, Denise. I'm sorry that we've run out of time, but I'm sure our audience this evening would just like to thank you. And I'm just going to remind everyone, please, if you've not uh, read Rizzio, read it. Um, if you want to buy a copy and get Denise to sign it, I would really encourage you to do so. Can I, can I just answer some questions before so that we don't... Natalie Halligan at Vidal Sassoon in Princess Square. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just see if you're coming up and one at a time. <laughs> And this is Barbara Kolosinski, who's a maker. Uh, she's a designer, and she's in Finiston, and she's on on the website. So just, I just save you all the bother because it's. Way. Thank Yay. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask about that. <laughs> I was going to put it on my website because it is a <laughs> question I get asked has, the most. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to everyone for coming out this evening. I know it's still cold and the world is going to hell in a handcart. So I'm really, really pleased that you've rocked up this evening. And, and thanks to Paisley uh, Literature Festival for this wonderful event. Thanks ever so and much. And Adele Patrick as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. So nice. That was brilliant.